Hello and welcome to episode number 385 of the Armin Show podcast, science, people, creativity, learning more, doing what we can to expand our framework, the coolest guests ever, subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, all the places, Google Podcasts, wherever it might be, audio, video, and the clips are doing very well, glad to have your support across the board. On this one here, very cool in person, which are the best, our favorites on this, because in person you get more, there's something more about it, higher bandwidth than you can imagine. My guest today butterfly expert we are in cal state long beach right now we have dr susan finkbeiner susan welcome to the show thank you for the invitation i'm super glad to have you on this is fabuloso we are in your lab room what do you study how did you get here and what brought you to here What's the path to the, <laughs> the current path. moment? It is a very long and winding path. I'm not going to lie. We um, want to know. <laughs> but it started when I was very young. I've had a fascination with insects since I was about three or four years old, ever since I basically knew what they were. I was always collecting them, chasing after them, observing them. And from a very young age, I knew I wanted to study insects when I grew up. And I had... Um, sort of a favorite of mine, which were the butterflies. A lot of people think it's because they're the prettiest. I think it's because they were the most challenging and the most fun to uh, collect and capture and chase after. And uh, so from a very young age, I knew I wanted to study entomology. Uh, by the way, I grew up in Illinois, so I'm from the middle of the country. Uh, I spent a lot of time out in uh, the, the great outdoors, in the prairies, forests, etc., collecting insects. And uh, kind of the first step was, okay, for college, where would I go? Where can I go to study entomology? So I, I got my uh, undergraduate major in entomology from Cornell University uh, out in New York. And then I... Um, went to UC Irvine to get a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology. And during that time, I spent um, most of my time doing field work and collecting data on tropical butterflies in uh, Central America. Then following my dissertation work, I went on to do postdoctoral research at Boston University, where I continued to do field work with tropical butterflies, this time both in Central and South America. Then I did another two-year postdoc at University of Chicago. Uh, so I'm moving around coast to coast to coast here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did some genomics work there. And then I got my first faculty position at Pepperdine University as a visiting assistant professor. That would have been 2019. And then um, I got a position as a full-time lecturer here at Cal State Long Beach. And so I'm very grateful. I get the opportunity to teach entomology. I teach ecology. I have also taught conservation by Biology and I teach a course on my sort of area area of expertise, which is in um, coloration and vision. And I've done a lot of research with understanding the evolution of butterfly wing patterns, how that connects with their visual system, and also how predators respond to some of the different wing patterns that we see on butterflies. Now, were there any, I usually include this later, but were there any people that caused a fork in your path? Or was it already meant to be from very early on? Was there, any, was there anything that guided you in an alternate path than you would have on your own? Any people that directed you this place or that place that you wouldn't have otherwise? Uh, well, I will admit, as a young girl in a uh, somewhat rural part in the middle of the country, uh, when I told people when I was growing up, I want to be an entomologist, I want to study insects, half the people didn't even know that that existed, that you could even make a living off of that. And most people told me, you're smart. Don't you want to be a doctor? Or, you know, there are other things that you could do uh, instead that are going to, uh, where, where are you going to find a job? And I think a lot of people uh, had this misconception that you can actually uh, be a research scientist, uh, especially working at institutions like universities, where you get the opportunity to carry out work that's fascinating to you and and also get paid uh, to do so. And and I've actually heard from a lot of old friends and teachers that I've had, you know, I'm not going to say how old I am, but back in, you know, the 90s, uh, that have said, wow, I'm very impressed that you made this happen. And so there, I wouldn't say it was ever discouraged, uh, but there were some people that didn't quite think that it was possible to make it where I am today. But I will say that there was one um, 
sort of experience that I had as an undergraduate student that really helped me focus on and solidify what I wanted to do post-graduation as an undergraduate student and kind of the path I wanted to take in graduate school was uh, studying abroad in Costa Rica. I spent a semester abroad studying tropical biology and spent a lot of time in the tropical rainforest, seeing all the amazing, cool wildlife that there was, that or that was present, and then also seeing all the really cool bugs and insects and especially butterflies. Exactly. And uh, with that experience, I was like, wow, this is exactly what I want to do. I really want to go get my PhD. I want to learn more about this. And then eventually I want to teach uh, and do independent research. So um, that kind of helped me figure out the next step post undergraduate studies. Some students that did the semester abroad program realized, okay, this is not what I want to do. I'm not into this. Uh, other ones like me realized, like, this is exactly what I want to do. Let's go. That makes sense. You didn't have any pullback at all? No. No, no, no. no. I've no regrets. Everything, all, all the decisions I've made with regard to my profession, I feel like I've been very lucky. I feel like things have fallen into place in a very uh, positive way. So there's nothing I would change. How much of that is determination versus going towards what you like which one is the stronger pull factor oh i think they're the same thing they're the same i mean thing. it's like you're determined to go towards what you like and i tell people when i was earning my phd there were very very few days that I actually felt like work it was mostly fun and I think there's this misconception that to get a phd you need to be smart and i say no you just need to be driven and you have to just have this mindset that you won't give up because there are going to be times where things go terribly wrong. You get articles rejected. You don't pass exams, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you just keep pushing forward and will you know, eventually make it there. And it's that drive that is more important than your brains, I think, in that, in that context. Is it fair to say that when you really like something, nobody can compete with you on that thing? Uh, yeah, I would say so. <laughs> yeah. It's like you have a full force that yeah. you... Well, who's it? Uh, Billie Jean King said something like, uh, I don't remember the exact quote, but it was something about being obsessed. Uh, you have to be obsessed with something to succeed and be or be one of the best in your field with it. I, I'm not going to butcher her exact quote, but she's a famous tennis player, one of the best of all time. And um, if you're obsessed with what it is that you are passionate about, then you will work your way up the ranks to be one of the best at it. This is true. Now, wide variety. I want to go in multiple tangents, but I want to, as far as butterflies and entomology, why butterflies? Why not? Could have been caterpillars, could have been moths. Mosquitoes had an opportunity there. There's a new book on ants, I believe. Why this one specifically? Well, caterpillars are butterflies. Yeah, I <laughs> want to throw that in there. Challenge, stage. challenge, test. Uh, um, well, like I said earlier, I always felt like butterflies were the most fun to chase after, the most challenging to capture and collect. Uh, if you've ever chased after, uh, pursued a butterfly in, in uh, a field or a forest, and then when you finally capture it, even if you're just going to let it go, that feels good, right? It's it's part of human nature to chase after things and, and to get them. Um, butterflies were more fascinating to me, though, than, than most other creatures because they really do sort of win in terms of bright, bright coloration. I know there's some butterflies behind me. We, we have some iridescent individuals. They have some of the coolest pigments um, presented in some uh, insects and animals. They have a lot of both color-based uh, pigmentation and structural uh, or pigment-based coloration and structural-based coloration. Some even have fluorescent signals in their pigments. So I was drawn to the fact that they do have these, you know, really interesting color patterns. And I want to know why butterflies look the way they do and why they do the things they do. And a lot of my research does focus on that. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I loved chasing after moths, especially the larger moths. But butterflies in general are bigger than many moths. So it's like, okay, the cooler, biggest bugs. And they actually were some of the biggest bugs I could find while growing up. When I go to the tropics, uh, there are l very large beetles, very large spiders, a lot of really awesome things. But it's probably, in my opinion, butterflies being the biggest and best, most exciting, which is why I was more focused on them. And you can also find a lot of 
things with butterflies on them too, like clothing. And I know I'm not wearing a butterfly shirt today, but my entomology class every single day wear a different insect shirt. But most of my insect shirts have butterflies on them. So, yeah. It's super cool to be on theme. And you would not wear a spider shirt. Boo to the spider world. I'm kidding. No. Okay. <laughs> I'm so, I love spiders. They are so cool and they are so fascinating. Unfortunately, they don't have the best reputation on the planet. But oh, sp spiders are amazing. We spent uh, a week and a half, two weeks on spiders in this class alone. I took a whole course on spider biology when I was an undergraduate student. And it was a ton of fun. And uh, I know it kind of creeps up my students when they, they're they making insect collections and they bring in their spiders and I'm picking up the spiders and handling them and they're like, whoa. But I think they see I'm so calm with them and, and then their fears kind of subside when that happens. Yeah, the spiders are cool and I do have spider shirts. Not going to lie about that. Okay, confirmed everybody. Susan does have spider shirts. I love arachnids. <laughs> long live arachnids. They made like a uh, long, long time ago computer games that had them. There was like a... It was like a scary part of the game. It would no, include, it shouldn't like, be scary. Right. Spiders are smart. They have great vision for the non-web builder spiders. They're super fast. I mean, there are a lot of really cool things about spiders, but I think we're focusing on butterflies today. Right. So, Speaking of having collections of butterflies or collections of insects, can you describe a little bit of what is behind you, which is more insects than most people have in, I don't know, years of <laughs> walking around? What are we looking at here? So these are just some of the cases that we have in the teaching collection here at Cal State Long Beach. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the first one, I, I'm not sure if it's completely in the field of view on the camera, has some of our local species. We have monarchs, we have morning cloaks, we have um, uh, California sister, as well as their mimics, which are the limonitis, uh, or sorry, the Lorquins admiral. We have some... Um, Dryas butterflies, uh, or Agralis vanilli, that's the, one of the, fruit, Gulf fritillary, sometimes remembering the common names escapes me. Okay. At times we have painted lady. So, so that first case is showing a lot of our local species, including buckeye butterflies as well. The second one is showing some Peruvian butterflies. Um, uh, wait, Peruvian butterflies on the right. The middle one has butterflies from all over the world. Those are going to include some from Asia, from uh, Central and South America. I see our Rajbrook's bird wing on the bottom. The, and that middle, or that second case is more like just like a fancy, hey guys, look at how pretty butterflies are. We have a morpho there as well that has some iridescent coloration to it. The next one has some South American individuals and I, hopefully the uh, microphone is still picking up while I have my head turned here. Mm -hmm. um, those are going to be our, our South American uh, butterflies. And the next to last cage, we have the owl butterfly, the biggest one. The top and bottom individuals, the top individual shows the ventral side, so like the underside of the wings, and then below that you can see the dorsal side. It's a female, so she's uh, she doesn't have any sort of fancy colorations or, or such on the dorsal side, whereas some males do. We can maybe talk about that later, sexual dimorphism, mm -hmm. where males have more brighter colors than females uh, to attract the ladies. Um, and then on the far right, those are some more temperate species that we do have around here in Southern California. That includes uh, many of our swallowtail species, tiger swallowtail, giant swallowtail, uh, spicebush butterflies, I see, and then many of our uh, cabbage butterflies, sulfur butterflies, and uh, butterflies from the family Lycinidae, which are the little blues, uh, like hair streaks. So that's kind of basic rundown. Uh, in the flat case here are some moths, but they're not as brightly colored because they they tend to be nocturnal. Nocturnal organisms don't have the ability to use color vision, even if they have it. So in that instance, the moths, moths in general tend to be less colorful unless they're advertising a signal to something that is day dwelling or day flying and diurnal. There needs to be a purpose for anything. Form follows function. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you aren't using color vision, why waste the energy to produce color detecting receptors in your eyes if you're completely nocturnal and your predators are, right? So, and your potential mates. So in that case, no need to produce, go through the energy of producing a colorful pigment if it's not going to be used as a signal. I want to get right into that actually, because it's like a link to that. But before that, what are the most popular kinds of butterflies that people would know of? Um, probably the most famous would be the monarch. 
would be my guess. Everyone is familiar with the fact that they have these very fascinating migratory patterns. Uh, seasonally, they make this journey thousands of miles. It does take a few generations, but they eventually make their way back uh, to where the initial uh, parent had come from, which is very, very cool. Uh, I have to say monarchs are globally probably the most noticeable because they have a global distribution along with painted ladies. They're basically found everywhere and having that migratory ability means they have that dispersal ability. I think um, maybe the morphos are, are known as being kind of a flashy tropical species. People that go to butterfly houses uh, or butterfly sanctuaries might see a lot of the morphos and, and they're just so striking in their blue coloration and and blue pigment itself is actually not um, very common in the animal world. So the blue colors that we see on morphos are completely structural based, which means that it's shiny, it's iridescent. I keep hitting the microphone there. I'll try not to. Apologies if there's like a loud thump. We do it live. <laughs> I use my hands too much. Uh, uh, so anything with that we see with butterflies that has blue on it is typically going to be structural. And so it has a shiny iridescence to it. And so that, I think that's another reason why people know about morphos or are fascinated by them because of that shiny that shininess it's a pull factor those kinds mm -hmm. of things it works on us other animals as well we have some similarities oh it's another one i want to add in it's tough to even get to the one because i want to add in another one before that <laughs> i go on a million tangents i guess there's a lot of actually i'll um no, i'll leave that one for that so dating and relationships okay in the butterfly world what is it that uh differs between the male and female butterfly, how does the male butterfly attract the female butterfly? What does it look like in their world? Okay, so it depends. Uh, in many species, individuals are sexually dimorphic, meaning that the uh, male and females look differently in the adult stage. In the case of many butterflies, the males might be brightly colored, uh, have more attractive features to them. The females are somewhat drab. We see this in a lot of birds, too, um, for example. And the males would have these, you know, bright iridescent plumage on their feathers. Females are more brownish. Same with butterflies. Um, the males are the ones oppressing the ladies. And so when uh, during courtship, depending on the butterfly, sometimes females flying along and the males will kind of dip under them and flash their parts of their wing colors um, at them and, and open their wings in a certain way so the females can see that. And that's something that we see in cabbage butterflies, for example. I know there's some Cabbage butterflies in the back there and sulfurs, anything from that that family, Pierre Day. I'm going to try not to get too, too technical with we taxonomy like technical here. here. <laughs> and uh, Pierre's Rapei is the, the common cabbage butterfly, and, and the males will kind of uh, fly. They'll dart underneath the female, flash, flash parts of their uh, really, really bright white scales that have UV reflectance in them, etc. And then they'll keep kind of doing that to show to the female that they have this bright, flashy um, components to the wings. However, with that particular butterfly, we don't see as drastic of a difference between males and females. With the owl butterfly, sort of the, the largest one in that second to last cage, the males have, or um, not cage, uh, case, uh, the males have uh, bright yellow bands on part of the wing and, and a shiny kind of iridescent blue on parts of the hind wing. And that is, uh, those color signals are purely based on sexual selection by females, selecting for males that have those yellow and blue patterns on the wings. Um, however, in some species like uh, passion vine butterflies, genus Heliconius, it's a genus that I spent most of my PhD work on, um, they, the males and females look identical. They are toxic and they advertise this sort of unpalatability or unprofitability to bird predators. So if they both have this exact same pattern that is advertising that sort of distastefulness, then they both benefit better. Um, but when you have males and females looking exactly the same, if you add into that other species that look like them too, the best way that males are going to indicate to females that they are the correct species or vice versa is through pheromones. So scent signals and olfactory cues. Color is used as a long range signal for mate detection in butterflies, but as a short range signal to sort of confirm you have the right species, that's all going to be based on scent cues and pheromones and things like that. How much does scent say for them, similar to us, 
what their genes or DNA is, does it represent that pretty well in some way? Like we have the same matching antibodies or something like that? Um, it is very species specific in terms of pheromones. And, and I didn't mention this with moths, but moths rely much more heavily on pheromone signals to attract mates of females will kind of sit in one place and then um, will emit a pheromone. And then the males, one of the reasons moths have such brushy, feathery antennae is because the males are signaling in, cueing in on those exact olfactory signals and locating a female from very far distances uh, by detecting those those uh, molecules from those pheromones that the, the females are producing um, because they're not visual creatures. So that is very, very species-specific. Mods will be sort of cueing in on that. When it comes to butterflies, it is also species-specific, but whether it can give you an indication on an individual's fitness or how well that particular individual is going to be better fit than another one, less likely for pheromone signals, uh, more likely that would be done through other displays, like I mentioned with the, the the flight behavior of the male butterfly kind of flashing his wings to the female. In birds, it's about the song and the dance, you know, and things like that. So pheromone signals help with determining species, but for a particular individual to see if they're better fit than another potential mate, typically it is a uh, very other variation visually that that individual may have for moths though unfortunately as far as visual signals go uh not not going to be likely moths don't have very excellent color vision at all so hmm. what would you say is the most similar uh mating element between butterflies and humans and the most unrelated mating element if those come to mind <laughs> um most similar Direct copulation. I don't know if I need to go into oh, okay. more depth with that. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of machinery, well, if no, you like, want to call that, but I mean, are you right. talking about? No, but also, well, yes, that that's not bad too. See, I like adding more details. Mechanical, mechanical, yeah. <laughs> but also uh, for displays, are there displays beforehand to grab attention? Just as similar as we are, it's mostly like uh, yeah, visual. Okay, I see where you're getting at. It depends on the, the type of butterfly. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, females do tend to be more attracted to males that will have the brightest coloration, indicate the best quality in terms of being larger, uh, flying faster. So fitness based on like physiological cues, yeah, like a lot of times in, in the human world, uh, especially in the early age of human or early human evolution, the males that were faster, better hunters, etc., that plays a big role with butterflies. Now, obviously, hunting isn't an issue, but we do see, um, you know, males that forage better can get, um, at least in Heliconius, uh, if they're foraging more and finding very specific types of plants that have the right nutrients they need, they can actually transfer that to their spermatophore, which is considered like a gift packet to the female. So the extra nutrition going into a spermatophore when transferred to the female will also indicate uh, greater nutrition for the eggs as well. Uh, with Heliconius, rather than just finding plants that have nectar, they need to find specific pollen plants, which... Um, have extra protein and nitrogen in them. So these are the only butterflies that we know of that can actually uh, uh, externally digest pollen grains to a drinkable form. And they can live very, very long in the wild with this extra pollen supplement in their diet relative to most butterflies that just feed on nectar. That's a huge and advantage. So, exactly. So uh, if males are capable of getting this extra amount of pollen and, and showing they can get these resources, then that's advantageous for the female when she collects the spermatophore from the male. Um, but yeah, I was going to say in ancient human evolution, it's like, you know, can you can you run faster? Can you escape predators? Are you if, Usually bigger males had an advantage, um, especially with like male-male competition. Butterflies in some species do uh, are ter ter territorial and can fight with one another and you can see um, males chasing away other males so uh, we see that in humans <laughs> sometimes as well in terms of what's what might be different well there is one component to at least I'm thinking about visual systems now which mm -hmm. is where my background is 
a lot of butterflies have the ability to see in the ultraviolet range. And in some instances, not just presence absence of UV, but in a few very specific examples in heliconias, the females have the ability to see more than one ultraviolet color. Whether or not this has to do with how they perceive males is kind of unknown, um, but we do know a lot of butterflies have that ability to see this extra type of um, color that we as humans can't perceive. So there are likely other visual signals that butterflies are seeing that we are not. Um, and that could be one way that it's completely different. We just don't know. And also, yes, we as humans can smell, but um, <laughs> exactly if you, uh, uh, unless, hey, I was a victim when I got COVID, I couldn't smell for a while or taste. Everything smelled and tasted differently. But what is this taste? we're not relying on smell signals for like a yes or no, are you my species type thing. It's We're pretty clear on the fact that someone we want to mate with is our species. However, colognes, perfumes, etc., have been known to be attractive to people um, as well when they're interested in someone of the opposite sex. So we know smell can play a role, but it's not like a make or break situation when it comes to mating, at least. So hopefully that answered right. your question. That makes sense. Yeah, smell has a big impact or else the perfum perfumes and colognes wouldn't be sold. They wouldn't be an industry. Right. Yet. Well, and we you know with humans... Hygiene is important. If someone smells terrible, maybe that indicates poor health, and then that would be a reason why you wouldn't want to mate with someone because if they're unhealthy, you don't want your offspring to be unhealthy either. Right. Speaking of visual, perception very important. When you say perception, it makes me think of perception for butterflies, but also there's a lot of perception work for robotics, and that's the next frontier for robotics to have like robots be able to perceive things well and move them. As far as butterflies, a big part of it is their symmetry and their colors. You have wonderful butterflies behind you with all kinds of bright colors and whatnot. Um, how important is symmetry? Can butterflies recognize the symmetry of other butterflies? Does it represent something? Or are they all naturally symmetrical and there's not really much asymmetry there? Uh, okay, so you're thinking with regards to mimicry, right? Yes, and symmetry in general, yeah. Okay, so um, when it comes to mimetic patterns in butterflies... There are some that have almost perfect mimicry or symmetry between one species and the other where it's almost impossible for us to tell the difference between them unless we look at very, very specific parts on the wing or, you know, um, a wavelength of color or things like that. Sometimes those are difficult for other butterflies to tell the difference between and sometimes it's not with the whole idea of the evolution of mimicry and, and symmetry among different species of butterflies has to do with protection from predators. So organisms that have um, some sort of capture cost, think about if you're a stinging wasp or you're a toxic butterfly based on host plants that you consume as a caterpillar. Uh, if you have this toxin or this unprofitability to you, uh, you want to advertise that to predators so that they avoid you. This, the fancy word for this is aposematism, uh, warning signaling or warning coloration, which is how it's more commonly known. And oftentimes you have species that are aposematic, that bear this capture cost, that are distasteful, poisonous, toxic, etc., that are avoided by predators, which are namely birds. Birds are sort of our major insectivorous uh, predators and uh, butterfly predators in, in the tropics, especially, and in many temperate areas. So, so say we have these wing patterns that are learned as a, uh, something that should be avoided by bird predators, and then you have these sort of cheaters that come along that evolve a wing pattern to look like the toxic individual uh, or unprofitable individual, but that said individual does not bear capture cost at all, and it is quite tasty. Um, but by looking like something that is not tasty or dangerous, then they sort of get away with uh, copying or mimicking the uh, unprofitable individual. Now, depending on the predator and the frequency or number of sort of the toxic individuals versus uh, non-toxic individuals, the uh, mimics may be successful or they may not. And it depends on the predator's ability to learn that there even are tasty individuals in the area and potentially even learn the difference between those. So I had done some research in Costa Rica and Ecuador where I was looking at these sort of imperfect um, 
patterns between two butterflies that looked almost exact, except one of the bands on the wings was slightly more bluish uh, in coloration than the other. And maybe there were developmental constraints by the mimic trying to look like the, the model in this case. Uh, these developmental constraints are uh, allowing it to have some, or causing it to have some difficulty mimicking that exact pigment in the wing, but it's close enough. And in areas where this sort of mimic or non-poisonous individual was present, um, or what was less present than the, the poisonous individual, then it was fine. But when you had the non-poisonous one looking like the poisonous one and they were at the same frequency or same abundance in the same area, predators started to learn to tell the difference between them. So there are costs to not having this sort of perfect symmetry or perfect mimicry between um, different species in the case where one of them does not have this sort of toxicity or capture cost. But if both individuals are toxic or have this capture cost or um, are unprofitable, then birds just avoid everything that look like it. So it, it can vary. Uh, you have extreme levels of mimicry that are just so exact that scientists studying them mix them up and have to look very closely. And then there are other cases where it's like, oh, I see the extra line on the wing, different species I can tell. It, it depends. And then there are some predators that are really dumb in group. Um, I shouldn't say very dumb, but they do group some organisms that don't really look much like the real thing with the real thing and avoid it altogether. But that could do with how bad that cost is if they do try to capture the, the poisonous individual. Hmm. It can be like a huge risk, so I'll leave that for Yeah, them. exactly. They just kind of clump everything together. It's like, all right, if I see the red band touching the yellow band, I'm not going to mess with that. I almost died last time I tried to eat that. Let's just find something else to eat. Yeah. Do you think about game theory in relation to this? Like it's uh, trade-offs and pros and cons and this percent of risk and such? Um, with regard to like the a choice of predators, how much to mimic, uh, oh, how much okay. to not. Is there like a trade-off kind of like there's this one fish that it will clean other fish, but then it has to do it uh, quickly or the right way or else it'll get eaten by the fish. And there's like a system of back and forth. Is that the same in this case? There are. Well, we <laughs> that's interesting this, with the feeder fish. Um, we do see instances where depending on sort of the selective pressures to in in uh, terms of predation or even mate choice to look like something or not, um, the trade-off is there. But if it takes energy to produce a certain pigment or look a certain way, individuals will maybe try to to produce less of that signal and save energy for growth in another area of the body or something like that. Um, I'm trying to think of a, a really good way to connect that example. In regard to predators, there is a level of risk. And there are some birds that live multiple years that will go back and, and sample, once again, something that they had tasted previously that they that was toxic or noxious and they go back and try again to see if like can I tolerate it now or not uh, but that also can depend on how hungry is the predator um, what are the other food options available etc but when it comes to like butterflies looking like another yeah I'm not sure if I can really make a good connection there um, because that I mean that's a it's a process that takes millions of years of evolution to to uh, have selection for different colors and patterns on the wings, so. That's cool. I always look at the aspects of uh, pros and cons that any animal does for what they go for, how much they camouflage themselves, like some insects or uh, animals will camouflage like next to a tree, mm -hmm. how much they do that uh, versus, but that's over a long period of time. So it's kind of tough to just say it in a short period. They do this over generations. Yeah, well, um, there's an interesting thing. Uh, we all think that camouflage is great if you can blend in with your background and uh, nothing can see you, but then you're so limited to where you can actually spend your time. Imagine you're a brown moth on a brown tree. Um, if you go on the leaves, you'll be recognized. If you go on the grass or in a bush or something that is not the same color or substrate as your background, then you risk detection. Um, so individuals that are specialized to sort of 
look like certain backgrounds, that's great. They get away without being recognized at all by predators. But the moment you want to go forage or wander or look for food and you leave that background that you're matched to, that's a constraint. Or even finding mates. You, you put yourself at risk of detection even if you move. So uh, yeah, there's, it's like it's excellent to be cryptic and, and blend in with your background or look like a leaf, a green leaf, et cetera. But then what if all the leaves die? And then you're like this bright green thing with a bunch of brown leaves and then you stand out. Um, so there are those constraints to like looking like uh, something camouflaged. But then if you have what we would call like a secondary defense, like bright colors that you flash. So there are some moths that have this brown coloration. And then when bothered, they open up the wings and they show their hind wings. I have like bright red and yellow coloration that should um, startle predators. Or if they have eye spots that could startle predators, like that could be a useful signal. If you are aposomatic and you have this, this uh poisonousness to you i guess poisonousness or toxic that's no word winning word I, I guess it's a word um then you can go wherever you want you can advertise that a lot of butterflies that have these these aposomatic displays fly so slow and they just take their time they're so easy to collect with a butterfly net i think we've got some butterfly nets behind captured. me captured oh it's like they're the best if you're learning to catch butterflies because Nothing wants to eat them, so nothing is chasing after them in the wild because they are poisonous. But if we have a look at a non-toxic butterfly, say um, our our buckeye butterflies shown here with the, the eye spots, I mean, they just fly so rapidly. They're a lot more difficult to catch, but they're profitable for predators, so they taste good. So things that taste good are going to fly a lot faster than things that don't taste good because the ones that are poisonous just kind of hang out and just fly very slowly. And so they, but if you have that signal, you can go anywhere. You're not restricted to a certain area. So even if you're camouflaged, um, you don't necessarily get to go everywhere you want. I connect everything back to people sometimes because I'm very people oriented. <laughs> and this makes me think of the concept that if you are blend in and are not risk taking and keep it light, you're fine. You're camouflaged in a way. Yeah, like conformity, but, yeah. Sure. And then, but now let's say you actually want to go do something interesting and go to the leaf of life. <laughs> you can't go to the leaf of life because that would be such a risk that you wouldn't even go there because you know it's such a risk. So you remain in your spot that you put yourself in that felt comfortable for a period of time. That's a that's a strong corollary. Yeah, there. yeah I, I, don't, I don't know much about human behavior, but... I uh, am always fascinated with people that, that refuse to go outside of their comfort zone. And I, I mean, personally, if I go outside my comfort zone, that's exciting. I might be mortified in the moment, but then it feels good afterwards. I survived it. I think I don't have to worry about being attacked by bird predators if I go uh, outside of my area where I am used to living. So... <laughs> You know, speaking of going outside one's comfort zone, I oh, I got to throw that in there. I am slightly sunburned because I went outside and did a thing in a mountain, which is good. And it's shedding skin kind of like a caterpillar sheds to become a butterfly in some form. I think mm -hmm. you have gone outside your comfort zone through Costa Rica. And is by the way, is Costa Rica, would it have to have been that? Sometimes I think about the things that happen in life. Was there another, like, could it have been New Zealand and would it have been the same or... Was it something about Costa Rica? And can you tell us about what Costa Rica br brought to the table for you? Yeah, what's well, funny you mentioned that. So um, I brought up studying abroad in Costa Rica. And that was the first time I really felt like I was going outside my comfort zone. I was 20 years old. I, I had been outside of the country on my own before, but that was in Europe. I was visiting friends and family there, and this time I was going to a whole new region of the world I'd never traveled to. I had not been to Central America before. I, I was afraid. I remember taking the bus to the airport and thinking like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? Like, this is crazy. I don't know any of the people that I'm going to meet there. I'm staying with a host family. I My Spanish was subpar at that point. It's a lot better now. And uh, I just told myself, I will survive and it will be fun. 
And I did survive. And it was the best experience of my life because it really um, helped me realize, wow, this is so cool. And it was a country that I loved. And the wildlife and the nature was just absolutely amazing and phenomenal. And since that first trip I took down there for a semester abroad, I have been back close to 30 times. I'm going back to Costa Rica in a few months, or a few, a few months, in a few weeks, in like two and a half weeks. I'm going down with um, the tropical biology course here to a field station that I've been to about 20 times. I was back in Costa Rica in May doing some field research. So I, and I will be back again in July teaching a course uh, on butterflies. So, Happens to be butterflies this so, time. So uh, that kind of started opening up the doors for me to realize like, okay, it's fun doing field work in the tropics. It's incredible, amazing, fascinating. Going to new countries is something that I enjoy as well. Um, but that basically opened up that door for me to sort of first go outside of my comfort zone of what I, I was used to. And at that point in time, the only other place I lived far from home was at the university in New York, because I, I grew up in Illinois. And so this was me living in another country for four and a half months. And it turned out to spark what ended up being just, uh, I wouldn't say an obsession with travel, because if travel were a total obsession, I would be completely broke right now. I'm only partially broke. Uh, so I shouldn't have said that. Susan has a partial obsession with travel. <laughs> I love going new places. So every year I try to go new, to a new country. Um, and I was in Peru in January. The year before that, I was in South Africa. COVID was happening. And so things kind of calmed down. But uh, that made me realize that I enjoy traveling by myself and going to new countries I've never been to by myself. And um, it's safe. I mean, it's largely safe. I think people are afraid that something will happen or you'll get sick. Yeah, if you get sick, you go to the doctor. Yeah, there, there are. Uh, I've been in dangerous, many dangerous situations, and I've gotten out of it just fine. So I'm still here and alive and healthy and well. Thank gosh. Okay. <laughs> that is a thing that I think life rewards you when you reach for things, because that's what we're here for. To not reach for things, that doesn't. Well, what, how, what chapter of a book is that? <laughs> right. Chapter six. I didn't do the thing. <laughs> chapter seven i regret not doing the thing i guess that could be the yeah i'd rather do something and wish i hadn't than not do something and wish i had if right that makes sense yeah there's a pull factor there costa rica's specialties or um what when you went uh the first time or what is, what has caused you to go so many times specifically to there versus uh switching to a different location every single time so um, I actually spent almost just as much time in Panama. So I had two, two main field locations that I started going to. The wonderful thing about Costa Rica was, um, or is, that they have some really excellent field stations with laboratory facilities, trail systems, great national parks um, or, and, and regional parks. The country, the country takes very good care of its wildlife. And it has been, become a hotspot for ecotourism. And so the country is receiving a lot of money from tourists that want to see this sort of protected wildlife. So in doing so, that money can go toward keeping the forests healthy um, and then having these field stations that researchers can go to. So the, loca the locations to go to to do this field work um, were places I was familiar with. I had already even collected some data in these areas, and I, I knew I would be able to carry out the projects I needed to in the area based on what I had explored while I studied abroad there. And then I also spent much of my time at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in uh, Panama, so I'm a fellow of the Smithsonian Institution, and in the field station that, that I was spending my time in, uh, again, excellent laboratory facilities, um, excellent uh, forested areas for collecting data. I was doing a lot of uh, work in greenhouses where we had these butterfly houses when I was doing some behavioral studies, but then I could also do predation studies with birds in the, in the actual natural forest. So it all came down to resources as a researcher and uh, 
Costa Rica had a lot of very excellent field stations, and so does Panama. And so I was going back and forth between the two uh, to collect a lot of my data. That's cool. A lot of functional usage there. Exactly. Yeah. And other researchers too. So you're not like totally in the middle of nowhere lonely. Although I would spend my days in the field by myself and I would just start talking to all the insects and the butterflies. And, and hey, I'm still mostly sane, right? <laughs> That's kind of cool. It's better than, a, if, I mean, I could talk to a wall, but a butterfly is moving around and doing things. Yeah. Talk to the tarantulas and the birds and the monkeys that are following you. I mean, it all works out. If you didn't go to some of the key places you've gone to in your life, how would that Susan be different from this Susan understanding-wise, just in general? Ooh, you're hitting me with all the tough personal questions. I'm... I don't know if I can <laughs> answer that. Let's see. Well... You know, it was a big step for me, first of all, to go away from home for school. Um, New York was, it was like a 15-hour drive from my hometown. Casual 15-hour drive. Yeah, casual 15-hour drive. Uh, then graduate school, going all the way out to California, which is here now. <laughs> I was like, wait, I went to graduate school like 15 miles from, from Long Beach. So um, I think... I mean, I'd probably be married with kids <laughs> by now, uh, but I have, there have just been so many opportunities that have crossed my path and I have taken almost pretty much every single one of them that I feasibly could. And it's really hard for me to imagine myself without taking the paths I've chosen. I, I don't think I can answer your question what I, what I would be like, probably less, um, impatient when it terms of staying in the same place though because i've lived in a different place every few years because let's see i moved out uh to southern california in 2019 i was in chicago two years before that boston two years before that california for five and a half six years new york for four years but then while i was in california it was like 50 percent of my time was spent in the tropics so i was just i was all over the place um uh, but yeah, I think I would I'd probably be a little bit more reserved and not as adventurous. As much as I love being outdoors, I think I would feel a little less comfortable going out on my own, camping on my own, hiking on my own, things like that. So it's all about independence now at this point. That's pretty cool. And also makes me think, should I rename my show Tough Personal Questions? Because I could do that. <laughs> I could. I, could, I like that because it gets to the, I'm always personal, uh, personality oriented and people... But that makes sense, right? The the locations it, you go there, and then you build the ability to go to it. Yeah. So if tomorrow, I mm -hmm. mean, I'm I'm adaptable. I guess I I would consider myself super adaptable now. The fact that I'm able to make home any place that I've moved to at this point. Of course, my my home home where my family is in Illinois is is always deep down. You know, my roots where I grew up. All my family is still out there, but um. I have this adaptability now and I, I I'm comfortable wherever I do go. And if I do try new experiences, new sport, new hobby, et cetera, it's less scary to me because I feel like I've done a lot of things in my life that are otherwise risks, you know? So risk taking can come in all different forms. We've got two tough people at the table right now. <laughs> and actually that one. I, I mean, have you ever been on a runway in six inch heels in front of <laughs> Hundreds I've been very close to a runway where <laughs> other people were. It was happening near where I was. I think that's where we met at that's a fashion where, oh, show. Oh, that's a good point. We met at a fashion show, yeah. Susan, I want to add in this element, we met at a fashion show. That occurred, which is super cool. And I was more of a person there. You were more of, you could have basically been doing a fashion show if you were wanting to do so at that time. It was exciting. And it's, it's nice to see all the variety. I like all the colors and designs mm -hmm. and stuff happening and people. And it's it's got an up up nature to it. Yes. Which is quite cool. Actually, we should add that. There's too many things to add. I, I want to go to Illinois, but I also want to include this one. First, let me go back to Illinois first. There's something about the that Midwest, that region. I want to say like long live whatever, Minnesota, Illinois. Wisconsin. Wisconsin. All right, whatever <laughs> this, this region Almost any individuals from that region are delightful somehow. Not all. I can't guarantee all, but what is that? What is that? You know, we 
We have character because we tough out very, very cold winters. We get very, very hot, humid summers. The cold helps, right? I've said something like the cold <laughs> that makes the coolest people on the planet, I think. I mean, so everyone's like, oh, you're from the Midwest. That's why you're so nice. I, I had a, a roommate in Boston. I hope she doesn't watch this. Um, Please be she watching. She said to me once, why are you so nice to strangers? And I was like, why not be? It's, I feel like it's more effort to be mean to someone than to be nice. I love baking. I I uh, think that might be a Midwestern thing. My mom's from Nebraska. My dad's from Illinois. Um, grew up baking. I mean, there wasn't a lot to do, right? When you're in these more rural areas, it was like, hang out on my friend's farm, catch butterflies, collect bugs, have a lot of fun doing that. Or I would go on bike rides uh, with um, some friends in the neighborhood. Or it's like, okay, let's let's bake. <laughs> I don't know why we like baking so much in the Midwest. I love baking and cooking. Um, That's super cool. I Yeah, I don't know why we, we have this sort of niceness that's attached to us. For me, I mean, my parents are the nicest people I've ever known my whole life. I, I grew up in a very excellent household. Um, I, I don't know. It's hard to explain. It's just it's more simple when when you're living out there and there aren't a lot of pressures to look a certain way or do a certain thing it's more uh surrounding around what makes you happy and i, I mean yeah, everything is very family oriented in the midwest um but i think we're just we're hardy people we're used to difficult weather conditions everyone here complains when it's colder than 70 i start to complain when it's colder than 70 now but i can handle the cold weather now too i know i'm wearing like two layers <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I I couldn't tell you, you know, what makes Midwesterners so awesome, like we are, uh, but it, I have noticed after living on the East Coast twice and the West Coast twice that um, th there's an attitude that us Midwesterners have that that is less complainy and more sort of accepting oh something goes wrong that's okay we'll just move on you know do something else so yeah <laughs> i have this thought that the colder regions regions with more tougher weather puts you at adversity you become stronger you reach more into your human instinct which is something i've always thought about the more your human instinct kicks in the more you'll fu you'll f you are fulfilled in life if you're not using that, it's like not using the thing you were created for. Mm -hmm. And so if an area is quite comfortable and too satiating, you are not pulled to the roots that you have. You're not, even one person would say, you're not, I don't know if you said activating proteins, but you're not um, kicking in all the human systems that you have built in from generations and generations. So you don't get that joy you can get from that, like when you get a cold bath or you have scared or... i don't enjoy cold baths <laughs> I'm just gonna say that. nobody has to do cold baths that's true i don't i don't know if any person actually enjoys them on the planet well i will say this we in the midwest are very grateful for warm weather and myself being an entomologist since i was very very young the winters were just so hard to deal with because of like there's no bugs outside there's nothing to catch or chase i can't go ride my bike i mean yeah, you could play in the snow, you could go cross-country skiing, downhill skiing if you were lucky, if you made it up to the resorts in Wisconsin, re resorts in Wisconsin. Um, but I think the, the, the really abrupt seasonality would test your patience. So we are patient people. And you'd just have to wait for the, the weather to let up. I mean, I've been in situations that when I was at UC Irvine once, it was a really rainy day. And... Uh, one of the administrators um, working in like the main office was like, oh, are we, is the seminar still happening today because it's raining? I was like, the rain is not going to kill anyone. But I, I have no out here when it's raining, less people come to classes. In upstate New York, it'd be raining, blizzard, snowing, super hot, whatever. Uh, we all still went to our classes, took our exams, just kind of had to deal with it. Walking on, slipping and falling on ice, going up the slope in Cornell and Ithaca is what it, it is, what it is. You're just like a little bit more hardy. But uh, I have noticed, uh, no offense to East Coasters, they do complain a little bit more, though, about the weather. Whereas in the Midwest, we just would expect it. We know it's coming. 
and uh, then we push through it, and then the summers are there, and they're nice. <laughs> I saw this one thing one time that said that in West, people are uh, nice in front of you, but then actually not nice later on to their friends. And then on the East Coast, they're harsh in front of you, but, <laughs> but they're actually nice. Just They're harsh directly, but their harshness is niceness. And then uh, South was just, they're just nice. Something like South was just, they show up and like, hey, would you like this? And then Midwest was nice. I think it was similar to South. I don't remember if there was a difference from the South. We we like to do favors for strangers. We like to let the other person go first. We, uh, um, we're, yeah, we're just like, I'd say extra nice compared to the people in the South. <laughs> <laughs> Take that, people in the south. Okay, we have created a competition. Susan started it. We I'm... have equally funny accents. It's okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Is there an accent? Am I not noticing an accent? Do you have oh, an accent? I, I don't have it anymore. Ah. No, no, no. I have since. Um, uh, I was made fun of quite a bit for my accent when I was uh, at college in Cornell, and so I wiped it away quite quickly. You can do that. Uh, with time, yeah. Give it a few months. Uh, you know, my accent used to be so bad. It was so bad. And people would ask me all the time, what are you doing on Saturday? I'm like, oh, well, aren't you going to eat your hot dog and have a salad? Like, that was my accent. Is that also kind of like Minnesota? It was very similar. My hometown accent. I, I grew up right in the Illinois-Wisconsin border. And we did. We had less of a Chicago accent, more of a, more of a Minnesota-type accent. <laughs> so, for lack of better words, accent. Mark it on your calendar <laughs> that you're going to go somewhere on Saturday. It's like the A's. We're, we're terrible. But I, I like do. Like bag. Somebody you said say bag. 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 Not bag. Not bag. That's a Milwaukee thing. The Milwaukeeans. I, ha I have a friend from Milwaukee. And if he watches this, he'll know I'm talking about him. He says bag. And I'm like, no. Or people say bagel. 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 I, I say ba bagel. But there are different ways that people say different things. Milk. Milk. Eh. Anyways, <laughs> off off your topic here. No, but there is no. This is the armature. I got to remind more. Armature is including. It's like uh, nonlinear. Yeah. Non -linear. Well, I will add one thing though about the uh, the whole meeting at a fashion show thing. I don't know if I told you this. I used to be a runway model, so. I know this. Some people may know this. Can you tell us a bit about that? Because what? Out of nowhere. <laughs> well, speaking of going outside your comfort zone, so education has been my priority and drive through my life basically there were other things that I considered and hobbies that I wanted to sort of aim toward and and follow but um I said all right I want to get my PhD so after I finished my PhD and I was doing postdoctoral research in Boston uh, a friend joked with me like, oh, you should, you should, uh, try modeling. You have a nice smile. And I was like, all right, postdoc salary is notoriously crappy. I could use a little side hustle. So I, um, sent some photos to a modeling agency in and Boston. And you try things. You're a risk taker. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, all right, I could do this. In fact, one of the other researchers in the lab I was in, um, was a photographer. So he helped me get some sort of, uh, snapshots for my portfolio. And we had a little photo shoot right by the Charles River and, on, off of campus. And, and I sent those to the largest agency in Boston. They picked me up right away. And I thought I would get to do lifestyle modeling, which is, you know, sort of mundane, everyday tasks, people in commercials that are like taking money out of an ATM or, you know, someone buying something at the supermarket. Like um, those are what the lifestyle models do. They resemble the average person. And I considered myself like, okay, I'm average, but... I think modeling sounds cool. So, uh, but they had asked me like, oh, you meet our height requirements for runway. Do you want to go to London Fashion Week and do some fashion shows there? It was like, yes, but I just came back from spending two months in the Amazon rainforest. Like I'm, I've been in the mud. I'm like, don't know if I'm prepared for <laughs> I've been a in the mud. fashion show. Yeah. And so I had some training sessions for how to walk in heels and, and how to do the poses and things like that. And they sent me to London and I did my first fashion show, my first fashion week, and I loved it. So I've done five, five, five or six London fashion weeks. Now, my last one I did was um, February 2020 prior to the start of the pandemic. And 
after I moved to LA uh, in this area, my my focus was job, right? I, I'm university faculty now. This is going to take a lot of my time. I want to focus on this. And then I thought, okay, f- summer 2020, that's when I'll try getting back into modeling agencies. And then the pandemic hit and no one was doing anything. A fashion show stopped for a while. So maybe eventually I'll get back into it. But I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I've aged. So it's, it's different, but I still get my, you know, model uh, uh, zone in in my brain, maybe maybe I'll get back into it. We'll see. Runways are lucky when Susan shows up. But let me tell you, it was terrifying. The first time I walked out on a runway, I was just like, my mind went blank. I was just like, okay, one foot in front of the other. Keep your face. You know, you're like you your your serious model face. All I heard was click 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 of all the cameras and all the press in front of you, and it's just like, don't fall, don't fall, don't fall, don't don't like move your face like she's just like stay as calm as possible and look natural and then the moment i stepped off the running i was like oh my god that was such an ad- adrenaline rush i loved it i was like i can't wait to do this again and again and again and again so uh going outside my comfort zone made me realize something that i really enjoyed it's scary though i mean and sometimes you're wearing things that are revealing um but and I'm not going to lie, I was 30 when I did my first fashion show, and I killed it. So I, I She it. killed it. <laughs> I killed it. <laughs> Falling is the biggest worry, probably. If I, uh, I have not fallen or tripped on a w- runway. I did trip going off the stairs, but no one could see anymore. I'd already gone off the side. I feel like if I were to fall on a runway, I would make it look cool, and I would... Uh, I would maybe I would take a bow or curtsy after and then just keep going. Um, but I know some people really freak out. Just as long as the shoes I wear don't make me keep stumbling. <laughs> so cross my fingers. That never happens. Knock on wood or whatever. This is not wood. Whatever this substance is. Very strong lab table lab, material. Lab tables. Yep. <laughs> I don't know what they're made of. But it's really wonderful. Long live labs. <laughs> That's quite cool. And uh, an extension Everything we do is an extension of us. Some people did not have that in them, maybe, or have other things in them. They might have, there might be another entomologist, and this is completely not in their category, but they are an expert at chess, maybe, yeah. or something. Oh, yeah. We have these. Or a concert pianist, or a ballerina, or a singer, you know, you never know. Everyone is creative in different ways, but yeah, I've met some really cool centuries, like, well... I used to be competitive snowboarder, and I think I mentioned that to you. And I used to do slope style competitions, and which is like tricks, right? Jumps, rails, all that sort of thing. Oh, cool! With the USCSA, um, uh, which is the U.S. Collegiate Snow Sport Association. Susan, stop being cool for one minute. Can you pause? Can you just pause? Okay, that was a pause. <laughs> not, not to humble brag, but it's like I like crushing stereotypes. People think scientists are not well-rounded, or they think entomologists are stuck being obsessed with bugs, which I am obsessed with bugs. You're obsessed with bugs. We have over 150. I'm not staying in one bubble, though. I do like to do these other things that I think are fun. I do play piano. I'm a terrible singer, but I have hobbies, and I enjoy them quite a bit, but science is my favorite. So that's the one I stick with. But I, I know scientists that have the most amazing side jobs and hobbies. They're wonderful artists and painters. And it, it just it's, blows my mind. That's true. That element, not just scientists, but because I like science too in the same category, every group got put into a little box of some form. And I think this last actually five, ten years is a big branching out of like, no, I can be this and this and this. Mm-hmm. Whereas before, maybe 20 years ago, there's not room for that. It's, you are this, and that's all we can remember, frankly. <laughs> the average person, I can, you're, the, you're now you're a model? I am confused now, and I don't know if your science is good anymore now, oh, because you're doing the modeling now. It's always now. good. I'm just kidding. Right? Uh, but you well, know what I'm saying? They yeah, would do that math. Exactly. Well, and there's this, you know, stereotype surrounding, oh, well, a runway model with a PhD? I don't know about that. I don't buy that. Uh, and people think, you know, scientists can't clean up nice and walk in heels and, and be in magazines. I've been in, oh gosh, I don't even know how many mag- runway magazines I've been in. I've been in Vogue. I've been in all of these modeling magazines. I've been in science magazines. I was Miss February 
for BBC's Science and Tech magazine, I'll, I'll point that out. Uh, that was 2019. Yeah, 2019, I want to say, or 2018, one of those two years. And, and there was an entire article about my science and about my research. I was featured in New Scientist in their physical magazine copy for some research that I had published. Um, uh, that came out uh, not last fall, but the fall before that. So I feel like I am sort of um, representing myself in a way that shows that I put the science first and the modeling is just a fun side job. But science pays the bills, I'm not going to lie. Uh, my role as an entomologist pays the bills. Uh, modeling is just fun extra money that I can use to travel to new places. <laughs> so, um, But it, it's there and, and hopefully it, I can be a role model for people that little girls that want to be scientists, but maybe they're pressured to be, you know, be more girly. Well, runway modeling is pretty girly. I did ballet when I was a kid. Um, what did you not do, Susan? We're going to find something you didn't do. <laughs> I'm t I always tell people I'm terrible at playing soccer. Okay. I'm terrible Susan at soccer. Susan is not good at soccer. I love baseball and softball, but terrible at soccer. So okay. don't ever ask me to join in on a rummage game of soccer. So we're doing a rummage game of soccer? No. Oh, I'm my bit. God. No. Oh, so you're not going to do Knees, it? Knees, shoes. Just okay, that's not. <laughs> Susan says no. <laughs> She's not participating try. in something. <laughs> I would be terrible at it. Fair. That's good. Two things come to mind. One, it's good to talk your material because if we have done things, it's good to showcase them, mm -hmm. remind people. It's almost like uh, on the internet, it's good to repost something even six months later, the same thing because people forgot or they don't, mm -hmm. some people didn't see. You should talk your, I've done this, I've been there, I did that thing. And it, it, it puts a framework for people to work with versus if you don't do it because you're like, ah, oh, it's too much. It's not actually too much because other people have a thousand things coming in. And then uh, the more you showcase, barely hits a few points. Of, oh, and then they're like, okay, she does this and this. It's important to talk your thing. And then second thing is I've had a uh, model, Rebecca Faith Lawson, my friend in Florida, on the show twice. And we talked about authenticity one time or on the last episode. What is authenticity to you? What does it mean to be authentic? Are you being authentic? Is there anything you're leaving out that you want to bring up for the first time ever on this show? <laughs> I make it so dramatic. But what does authenticity <laughs> so mean? I like roll my eyes here. I'm like, mm, well, I, uh, I, I kind of don't have a filter sometimes. So <laughs> I kind of say what's on my mind. Um, I also come up with really stupid jokes sometimes. And I do that while I'm teaching. And most of the time, the students think it's funny and they laugh. So I'm like, okay, that's a level of authenticity, like this weird sense of humor. I don't know where it came from. But, you know, it's like talking about copepods that are living in intertidal zones, you know, dealing with these varying saltwater conditions. I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess these copepods are coping with these conditions. Get it? And then, like, you know, sometimes they laugh, sometimes not. It, but it has to be, like, on the spot there. But, yeah, as far as – I mean, I wouldn't say I'm being – Unauthentic or inauthentic? I actually, don't know the proper. Uh, in, to, inauthentic. Inauthentic. Well, non-authentic. <laughs> not not authentic, not authentic. Inauthentic. Um, if I were to try to be anyone else, I don't think I'd be where I am today. I'm like there is only one Susan Finkbeiner, and um, I people have asked like, oh, if you become famous, you're gonna change your last name or shorten your last name. I'm like. No, I can't do that. Why would I do like a stage name if I ever went into showbiz or acting or whatever? And I'm like, nope, I'm the same. My name is on how many publications I have now? Like 10, 10 first author publications and several others. And I'm just like, I can't change my name. It has to be like what I've done as a scientist has to be associated with what I do with the rest of my life. Um but I, I feel like I have no reason to be inauthentic. You're like really grilling me. I'm like, do I have it? Do Tell I have any questions. secrets that I can share? I mean, that would be a real hard I don't hitter. Know. I haven't exercised in a really long time and I feel guilty about it. But <laughs> When you say a really long time? Uh, minus some ski trips. But that, Okay. Ski trips are not light, I would say. But I'm like, okay, people will ask, what's your secret? I'm like... Well, I eat like crap and I should eat better and I don't exercise. But if I did, that's when I'll hit the runway again. So, yep, no secrets for you though. Sorry. That's that's all right. But I guess we found some information. You're able to not eat so well, not exercise much, and just roll through smoothly. I love sweets and I love to bake. So that's a bad combination. I bake brownies and then I eat all of them in two days. 
for some individuals, this might work against them, this collaboration <laughs> of activities, but hasn't been the, the case. The secret. I am a butterfly. I eat sugar. <laughs> Do they eat sugar, by the way? Nectar is yeah. glucose byproducts from pho plant photosynthesis and that attracts them to flowers. Most butterflies are liquid feeders, so they're looking for sugary solutions that flowers produce. Challenge question out of nowhere. Armin transitions like who oh, nobody else. I spoke about one type of mimicry. What is Batesian mimicry? Ah, Batesian and mimicry. Batesian. So Batesian mimicry. And what advantages does it cause for survival? Um, I will first point out it gets its name from Henry Bates, my favorite naturalist ever. When I read if, it, I think of Bayesian, but it's not. No, not like Bayesian, Bayes, just it's... like Bayesian statistics. Um, I used to call it Batesian mimicry too, but then I realized, yes, yeah, named after Henry Bates, famous naturalist in the um, early to mid 1800s, like around the 1830s or so. He and Alfred Wallace went to, I think it was 1829, they journeyed to the Amazon. And uh, Bates is responsible for basically coming up with this theory of what we know to be our typical mimicry where you have something that is unpalatable, toxic, poisonous, etc., something that has a capture cost that is advertising that with a color pattern. If something harmless that mimics that color pattern and tries to look just like it, that is considered Batesian mimicry. So basically the, the concept of mimicry that I went over earlier, the other form of mimicry is Mullerian mimicry, which uh, is when you have two individuals that, that have the same wing pattern or phenotype in the context of butterflies that both have a capture cost or both unprofitable or dangerous. So they collectively are um, advertising that signal. But in Batesian mimicry, you have a harmless individual mimicking a dangerous individu individual. Mealary mimicry, both individuals are dangerous, if that makes sense. So, so that's Batesian mimicry, is our, our typical concept of mimicry or theory of mimicry. And the cause, uh, what advantages it provides to survival? You get away with um, not having to produce a toxin or poison, um, but you're avoided by predators, whereas your sort of toxic counterpart, we think about butterflies, which for me, you make the best examples for a lot Long of things. Long live um, Experience some level of maybe slower growth if they're feeding on toxic host plants as caterpillars or have to put forth, they have to put forth energy into um, not just sequestering, but in some cases synthesizing the toxin, the toxic compounds in their host plants that the caterpillars are eating. So for example, with heliconius, they feed on passion vine flowers, which are um, infused with uh, cyanogenic glycosides, which are cyanide compounds. So they have to deal with developing while consuming these toxins. It's energetically costly, but then as adults, they are protected by having these toxins and they advertise those toxins with those wing patterns. So you have another species that looks like it that is feeding on something super tasty that is not toxic and they they have no problem developing no extra energy putting forth into dealing with these um, or, or energetic constraints dealing with these toxins. They kind of get away scot-free by looking like the, the toxic individual, but they're not toxic. So they benefit um, from not having to do the work to deal with those toxins and just look like something that's toxic. But the toxic individual does have to put in the work to, to be toxic. So that mimicry, um, uh, can, uh, Batesy mimicry can completely break down in places where you have a lot more individuals that are not toxic or are not dangerous starting to pop up. Um, and you still have your dangerous They're individuals, like then it's, it's exactly. And then it's no good for anyone. And the fitness drops for everyone just because predators start to learn something's going on and then they can eat some of them. And then some of the dangerous ones do get eaten too. And it's just a total mess. That sounds like a total mess. Yeah, it is. It's complex. Very complex. Butterflies evolve over time. We evolve over time. There's different types of evolution leading to maybe four different types or evolution can come together and make one because that that's the prime or that's the top way to go. 
convergent right. evolution. Divergence what is or convergence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so we think about mimicry as converging on a uh, sharing a similar wing pattern. In that case, individuals are converging to look like the same thing. But in a lot of our cases, those uh, with butterflies, individuals that look similar are actually distantly related. So they have converged phenotypically to look similar, but genetically, um, they are very, very different, if that makes sense. So convergence in that context is completely different from uh, if we were to look at a phylogenetic tree, a phylogenetic tree. (laughs) <laughs> talk today anymore. Uh, if we were to look at um, a phylogenetic tree of, of Heliconius butterflies, for example, that have individuals that have such strikingly uh, like similar wing patterns. I don't know if I have two of the same. I don't think I have two of the same uh, species or sorry, two different species that look similar here. Uh, I do not. Sometimes there are. But there are some, they're, they're very distantly related, but they look exactly the same. So they've converged on, on having the same wing color pattern. You might have other individuals that diverge where um, if, if uh, two individuals have drastically different wing patterns, maybe if they both have uh, high levels of toxicity, though, that's okay. And predators can learn these two distinct different patterns. Um, but uh, from an evolutionary standpoint, um, uh, species diverge, but phenotypes or color patterns can converge if you are going to be better suited to your habitat with that convergence. So we think about uh, convergent evolution in plants, for example, around the world where you could have plants. Um, we have plants here in Southern California that are very similar to plants that we have in parts of Australia or parts of Mediterranean uh, that are very, very distantly related genetically to one another, but look almost exactly the same and have very similar morphological features because they've adapted to this particular, um, habitat, habitats and backgrounds and conditions and weather, etc. which by the way, speaking of Australia, I'm totally backtracking to the whole Costa Rica thing. Um, we like backtracking and backpacking. I initially had wanted to study abroad in Australia. But I uh, consulted a professor about it, and she knew, she was one of my entomology professors, and she knew that I wanted to study tropical entomology, and she was the one that introduced me to the program in Costa Rica and said, this is what you want to do for your semester abroad, given the path that it looks like you want to take. So I listened to my mentors in that instance. I did not go to Australia. I still have never been, because I remember you mentioned New Zealand earlier. Someday... But for now, um, I think the next location on my list for travel is probably Nepal. Just throwing that out there. Is that because the letters can rearrange the plane or is it for another reason? I would like to, cross my fingers, hike to Everest Base Camp. I did a trek in the Andes, hiked the Inca Trail in January. In one day, we did a 14er, which was like challenging, but fun. I survived. Uh, I've hiked about Shasta before, so I'm like, okay. I figured out how to deal with high elevation. I think if I had a few weeks, I can make it to Everest Base Camp. There's no way in heck, I won't say the bad word, um, I'd make it to the top. But Base Camp would be like, okay, I could do that. I'd been in that elevation before. So do it while I'm young until I can't hike mountains anymore. There's something to when you have done things that then you uh, forever after that, things of that nature are like eating cake. Yeah, but also it's like... You want to one-up yourself. And that was the hard thing about publishing, too. It's like, oh, my gosh, I just had this amazing discovery. I really hope that I can top this someday. And you never know. With science, you never know the direction of of your discoveries. You never know if the methods you've come up with are going to work or yield results that you expect. Or maybe they yield something you don't expect but are even more important. Like, it's, it's crazy. So there are things we want to do in life where it's like, what's what's next can i get better and better and better and with science you never know because uh it depends on what you're studying i mean sometimes you think something might yield a really cool result and then nothing happens so it's it's hard but i love publishing i'm not gonna lie that's a cool feature that makes the ability to be prolific in that category Mm -hmm. i get the feeling that if i was able to place you in any country on the planet is there any country you'd be like oh 
I'm not prepared for this or no? Hmm. Well, it's, f- I, I, I've had conversations with, um, some people that work with discovery on this and discovery channel. <laughs> they told me that one of the, the guys, the president was like, you know what? I been to the middle East. I've been to war zones. I've been to all these places, central Africa, but the, place I'm most afraid to go to is the Amazon. And I just laughed. I'm like, I've been to the Amazon jungle so many times and I love it there. And it's like, yeah, you get parasites. Yeah, there are things that can hurt you and kill you. But as long as you know what to look for, yes, there are deadly spiders and snakes, but as long as you're paying attention, very few people die there, you know. Um, (laughs) When I think about places, I'd be unprepared. I mean, maybe Antarctica. I would love to go there, and I know you can camp there, uh, and their summer isn't all that bad, but I would be unprepared because there wouldn't be much to look at. <laughs> I mean, invertebrate-wise, even though the insect with the smallest genome in the world is found in Antarctica, it's a tiny fly, um, I would be probably unprepared in terms of, I wouldn't say boredom, but lack of exciting arthropods would be difficult for me. However... There are penguins, and there are really cool things to see there. And I would absolutely love to go to Antarctica someday, so I'm not ruling that out. That's kind of funny. Somebody's like, so do you want to go there? Look, there's a lack of arthropods <laughs> that matter to me. And what you know what? I've been to all 50 states except for Hawaii. And one of the reasons I haven't want, like felt the urge to go to Hawaii is because I'm like, oh, the insect diversity just isn't that great there. Even though they have like some cool modifications in some of the species there, I'm just like, mm, well, there's a lot of fruit flies, a few butterflies, just like monarchs and cabbage butterflies, probably painted ladies, and then some hydrophilid beetles. And I'm like, no, I need I need all of the big giant bugs. Hawaii doesn't have giant bugs, so it's kind of sad. <laughs> so, neither does Antarctica. Not to say that they're the same, but I will go to Hawaii. I want to surf in Hawaii. I want to visit Hawaii. Uh, I'm waiting for like the right moment to celebrate 50th state I've visited. Yay. Uh, I have been to the Middle East. Um, I was born in Iran. Just throwing that in there. I've been born in Iran. Uh, I've not been to Iran, but I have been to Egypt, Jordan, um, and Israel. And I enjoyed my trip. I did get into some dangerous situations there. And, uh, I never felt like this is it. This is terrifying. I'm going to die. Yes, I've had guns pointed at me. I hope my parents don't watch this. They know this story. Um, and and been caught in uh, areas where there was combat. And and uh, I, I'm okay. You know, I'm fine. And physically and mentally not harmed by these situations. When I was in Peru... There were a lot of protests, uh, people with weapons, too. I mean, the protests did get violent, and these were kind of starting up when I was there. And that some of my trips got cut short or changed because of roadblocks and dangerous areas that needed to be avoided. But um, if you go to these places, though, and then you come back unscathed or even slightly scathed, it's like, okay, like it was it's not so bad. Like, I can survive these areas, but you get a better understanding of the world, too. And I think that's really important. Sometimes unplanned things happen. We don't plan all the parts Mm -hmm. of a trip. Yeah, exactly. It's like you go for the science, but you stay for the civil unrest and listening to the people there because you want to know what it is that they're fighting for, you know. And so I'm not huge into politics, but I'm interested in it and... I think it's important that we, you know, as scientists, when we go to other countries too, if whether we're there for field work or not, that we listen to the people and get a, more of a like broader idea of how the world works because the United States is kind of a bubble. Yeah. It's, it's bubbleular. I like to make that word. It's a bubble what? It's bubbleular. It's like Bub- a oh, circular for circle. Bubbular. Bubbular. Bubbleular. I, just, I want to take full credit for that. <laughs> that would be if I was I was teaching, it would be my... Spherical. That's too easy. It's <laughs> circularizing. Only if it's a bubble that has iridescence around it, then I'm happy. Like so. Anyways. <laughs> a scientist would include iridescence. <laughs> I have 400 tangents, but no, I'm limiting it to these two items. One, uh, what are uh, these two last items? One is what are three traits of yours you identify with that you would describe of yourself? Tough personal questions, by all. <sighs> Or the personal stuff. I'm I'm always people-oriented. Yes. (laughs) Okay, so 
We have both in this. Well, say, repeat that again. Three qualities you would identify with. Like I, for me, I both resilient, fearless, creative. I had one, a non-contextual, but that's oh, four. Oh man, but... mine are going to be so basic. Let's and like, this. just because I haven't thought this through to be creative. That's, a, that's <laughs> the challenge part of this. It's supposed to be not that. Deep. Um, Ambitious, for sure. That's clear. Stubborn. Stubborn. I am very stubborn, which goes along with being ambitious. Because if I don't get a result that I'm hoping for, I just keep trying and trying and trying. If something fails, keep trying and trying and trying. So it's ambitious, stubborn. I gotta think of something even more exciting. Kaleidoscopic. How about that? What is that? Kaleidoscope. And I know what a kaleidoscope like a kaleidoscope, is, kaleidoscope but... uh, shows uh, an image in so many different ways. So I have a lot of different sides to me, even though they all make up me as a human, as a person. Um, oh, man, I keep hitting the microphone. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> is life reminding you that you're always reaching for it? That's oh, the microphone. Yes, exactly. It's, it's all... Because you in... reach for life more than most individuals. <laughs> um, yeah. Kaleidoscopic, I think, has to do with being adaptable, too. Where I... Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I can adapt to different jobs, to different research ideas, to different hobbies, different lifestyles, living in different places. Um, but myself, with you know, my interests and hobbies combined with my profession means that I as a human am like just a kaleidoscope full of these different components. So yeah, I think kaleidoscopic is my win for my my term that's that's not super basic that I can use. It's a super cool word. I never heard use the description it makes sense what you're saying because actually I would describe it for yours because you have so many I don't know if it is a word, but I'm making I'm coining it now. Kaleidoscopic if that is not a word. <laughs> it probably is and it, but used in terms of description of self, this might be a first. Okay. Possibly. That's super cool. I had another add-in, but no. And then last, I would like to check if you had a message to all people. I always throw this in. Sometimes it's from related to a book, but is there any themes from your studies or a message you would have to people just in general in life that you would want them to take away? It doesn't have to be related to studies, but could be. Is there any large themes that if you had a megaphone to all the people on the planet... You would want to oh, showcase that. No, no pressure wow, on that so one. So much pressure. Just 8 billion people. No big deal, Susan. <laughs> 8 billion people as of November 15th of last year. There we go. I mean, our population is skyrocketing. They want to hear this. Um, Oof. Man, putting me on the spot here. Yeah, I have to have some enjoyment too, which is putting I people know. on the spot. Uh, you didn't tell me about this. One, I maybe. sure didn't. And I want to <laughs> confirm to all individuals. And a message to the world. Okay, so I'll say... Um, don't listen to people <laughs> because part of the reason why I'm here today is I did not listen to people that told me what to do. And uh, I, uh, yeah, in some cases I got in trouble, but, and in some cases I would advise to do one thing, but I, I did another that I felt fit, um, my passion more, even when it came to my own profession People suggested to me in the science realm, you should do more work with genomics, which I did, but it wasn't as fun to me. I was like, no, no, I like the natural history. I like the behavior. I like these components of science, uh, of entomology that make me happy. I don't care what's going to look good on a job application. I want to do what's going to make me happy. And so, yeah, I, I'll admit I don't have a research position at an R1 university, and maybe if I'd done more work heavily in genomics, that's the case. But I couldn't be happier. I feel like I had the, the jackpot, the lottery. With the job that I have now, I have, um, uh, I'm teaching exactly what I love, and I still get to collaborate on projects. So I didn't al always follow everyone's advice, and I didn't listen to what some people said because deep down I felt like I should do something else. Um, but I also didn't give up. So if you decide you want to do something else, you can't just drop it. You really got to go for it and try your best to to do your to to be the best that you can. And if you set as high a bar as possible for yourself, no matter what it is in terms of the field you're going into, then uh, you will be very happy with yourself at how far you come along. So set that bar as high as possible for yourself. And if people tell you you should do something that is not exactly what you think will make you happy then don't do it so i mean that kind of sounds simple but 
um, you have to have the guts to go outside your comfort zone again, back, circling back to that, uh, and think about what's really going to make you happy. Think about you as a person, not necessarily the other people around you, if you, you because you should put yourself first and foremost. And so don't care about, you know, what other people say you should do. I, I knew somebody in college that was so passionate about marine biology, loved diving, wanted to be a marine biologist, but his parents wanted him to be a medical doctor. So he felt he had no choice. I was like, you do have a choice. So I'm grateful that my parents were highly supportive of whichever path I wanted to take in life when it came to education and science. Um, but other people are not as lucky. And so I say, don't listen to anyone. Just do what you want. That's my, <laughs> that's my advice. And work hard for it and toward it. And you'll you'll get to where you want to be. That's a very strong point, and I have to add in that I highly relate because the worst errors I've made my whole existence, things that happen short term, they're not a big deal. The chronic things in life are the things that matter, and the ones that you do to yourself because you listen to people and you left your thing alone, there's no bigger error than that because you're the only one that looks back that, oh, mm -hmm. I left my own thing. Nobody else notices. Yeah, the where you way. are now is an accumulation of so many things in your past, and... Um, Oh, shoot, I was going to add something else to that. You're in accumulation, I... uh, not listening to people. Um, go, uh, if you listen to them, you're the only one who will uh, pay for it. You're the only one who will notice. That's true. Yeah. I still can't remember exactly what it was I was going to say, but if it comes up later, I'll let you know. <laughs> We're an accumulation of all the parts. Yeah. Yeah, we are. And, um, you know, it doesn't matter what, how much money you make or whether it's short-term or long-term, I think in the end, ugh, I don't want to sound like super traditional or basic. She is but, so super traditional and basic. I mean, how we end up um, living our life, I think is more important about, or more important compared to how much money we make and all that good stuff. And so do what makes you happy because money cannot buy happiness no matter what people think. Your time is your currency, Right? So spend your time doing what makes you happy and then you're fine. I mean, you don't want to be on the street, but still. <laughs> Practicality makes dinner right. Sprinkle. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's super cool. Dr. Susan Finkbeiner, I would like to thank you for having joined on this wonderful episode of the show, sharing quite a bit about butterflies, insects in general, butterflies specifically, mimicry, broader exploration, different countries, what you did there. And the various tangents that I brought up, shout outs to Armin. Yeah, it's, man, the personal questions. They got me. <laughs> that is I wonderful. like the butterfly questions. The that insect cool. questions, science. Anyways, yes, I went on tangents too. We both went on tangents. Thank you for having been on. <laughs> All right, thank you. And we are out.